So tell me about who John Badawater is. Um, I've been married for almost 50 years. I've lived in this house for 42 years. I've basically been self-employed almost all my life. I worked for my dad the first four years we were married. And then after that, I bought cows and started my own dairy. Dairied for about 10 years and then bought a milk testing lab. Sold that to my oldest son. And then after that, uh, him and I were talking. And he says, well, Dad, if you're interested in politics, go ahead and, and give it a try. And so uh, Bill Sally was running for Congress, and it was an open house seat in, in this district. And so I put my name on the ballot and started knocking on doors. And I've been in, in and out. I was in for two years and then out for two years because I lost my re-election in a primary by 56 votes and then came back two years later and got back in. So I've been in a total of 14 of the last 16 years. And it's been an interesting challenge for me. You know, I, I've served the last 10 years on health and welfare. Not my field of expertise, because I'm ag uh, business owner and stuff like that. And so if I've never been in health and welfare field as far as all the issues and stuff like that. But I've served on that committee now for the last 10 years. The last two years, I was actually vice chair. Well, I mean, on the, on the health board, I think people often forget that uh, health districts, public health districts, also do a lot of environmental stuff. So, you know, yeah. you, you can Yeah, play and I've, you know, and uh, dealt with, you know, Central District Health on, on other issues, you know, as far as uh, when I was out for two years, we bought a convenience store, feed store, gas station, my son and I did. And then you have to go to health and, uh, to, to the health boards in order to get certified. Otherwise, you can't you can't cook food or sell food, and, and they inspect you on a regular basis and stuff like that. So yeah, you will learn a little bit from that end of it too. Yeah. And you said you know your son was like, if you want to go into politics, try it out. What you know, what prompted you to kind of want to be interested in politics? Always have followed politics, but being ag and being rural you know you're not in a city you don't run for city council you don't run into the political aspects of it served 16 years on the napa christian school board and so i i'm used to serving i've served with the boys and girls club in cuna and stuff like that so i've always kind of been used to you know giving time to to serve the community and so i thought well hey man he'll try ag. i'm surprised that i that I've been in that, in politics this long, <laughs> you know. Uh, I used, I used to tell the freshman class when they came in when I was caucus chair that you know I walk up the Capitol steps and I'm just amazed that they let me come here and vote on laws and and make new laws. And I said, after you get to know me, you'll be amazed they let me do it too. <laughs> so it, it's been a challenge and and a very interesting experience. Yeah. And. Um... <clears throat> You know, going off of that, what what are your three priorities if elected, if reelected again? You know, what would be the three things that you feel like are now important to move? You know, take some action on. I think property tax is probably the main issue. I would love to get rid of the grocery tax. I, I to me, it's unrepublican to have a tax and then you turn around and you give money back. In other words, we're collecting grocery tax money and then we're telling everybody, well, we're going to send you 100 or 125 or whatever. We're sending you the money back. That's not good, in my opinion, good Republican philosophy that you collect a tax and then you pay it back. Well, why do you want to collect it then? Um, the other thing I really would like to see us do, and I think we need on, from health and welfare perspective, I want to look back at this pandemic and see what we did right, what we did wrong, and 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 because it was so much i think flying by the seat of your pants of well we don't really know we're going to do this you know it's going to be a lockdown for six weeks we're going to crush the curve and then we're going to we're going to be good and two years later we're still talking about mass mandates and we're still talking about shutting down businesses and it's just i i want to look back at this and even i think one of the most detrimental things about this whole thing was if you're in the hospital, nobody can visit you. 
and we made some changes on that this year. But I want to really look back, and I think shutting down schools, how much does that hurt the kids? I mean, even I, if you're around kids, you know from facial expressions how they're, if they're, if they're getting stuff. Well, if all the kids wear masks. I, I just think we've done a lot more damage than what we realize going through this. And I want to take a good close look at it and say, okay, this worked, that didn't work, what works, what doesn't, and let's correct it so we don't make those same mistakes again. So you would say property taxes, grocery taxes, and then looking back at the pandemic and kind of evaluating that from all spectrums would yeah. be your kind of top priorities. Yeah, yeah. I would also like to, as far as taxes go, is take a look at where we where where do we want our taxes to be instead of well this year we're going to do property tax next year we're going to do income tax and then we're going to do another tax and it's like but where do we want to really end up what do we want our tax structure to look like so that we have a you know otter did a five-year plan for schools so then he knew what he wanted to, where he wanted to go and so every year you knew what the steps were we don't have any plan of where we want to go tax-wise. What do we want our tax structure to look like? I mean, we have a load of exemptions. Do we want to have less exemptions on a broader base? If we do, if we say that's our goal, then we can start looking. Everybody wants to look at the exemptions, but I, I've told people we did one when I was in, and it was a small exemption, but all the people who got the exemption showed up to testify against it. All the other people ignored it. So, I mean, there's an exemption on ski resorts. Why? There's an exemption of sales tax on newspapers. Why? Do we really need it? You know, and those are little ones. But I can tell you that if we try to take the exemption off of newspapers, the newspapers would all be at the Capitol telling you no. <laughs> you know? And so it, it's a lot of that, uh, where do you really want to be in five to 10 years that we need to, to instead of, and, and the legislature, because it's every two years, they tend to, well, I'm only here for two years, so I'm only gonna look two years down the road on planning, and I just think we need lo better long-term planning on all of it. That's an interesting concept. I haven't really heard that from a lot of lawmakers because, you know, kind of like what you said, you're in office for two years, so you kind of like want the plan to, be somewhat ended by then or you know getting close to the goal so yeah um, you know what would you say are you know kind of leading back into the legislature what would you say are some of like the pits and peaks of this year the roses and the thorns you know what did you think were things that you would label as accomplishments of your own or of the body and what would you say uh, you know, maybe were there any pieces of legislation that didn't get passed that you wanted to see pass, or any issues that weren't addressed that you wished were? Um, early on, we talked property tax, and everybody said, oh yeah, I got a plan, I got a plan, you know, we're going to do income tax first, then we're going to look at property, and we never got it. I mean, they had a plan at the end of the session that blew up by the time before it actually got, by the time it got introduced, it wasn't, you know, and so, I think we need to have a better plan in the beginning. I don't like waiting till the end to do tax policy. And it seems like so every year, it's like the last week, last two weeks, we do tax policy. And, and that's not good planning again. It let, put it out to be, so I was glad that we did the income tax right at the beginning, got that through. But I was disappointed that after that, we with the surplus we had that we didn't do anything property tax wise. Property tax is a little more difficult issue because it's, it's basically controlled by counties and cities on, they set their budgets and then they set the levy rates. So it's a little harder from a legislative point of view. So, and um, some of the stuff that I, I didn't like was the more dependence that we're getting on federal dollars. The amount of federal dollars that are coming into this state I think we went from five billion to ten billion last year, and and our budget, you know, is getting more and more federal dollars. Now we're going to get infrastructure money, and I think, well, that's a good thing. Then I don't have to pay the raise our gas tax in order to pay for the roads, you know. And so some of it works, some, but it has to be it, it has to be one-time expenses because I think you know Congress could shut the spigot off anytime, and then what do we do then? Well, we no longer have the, you know, the money there and it could change everything drastically.
Matter of fact, I don't, I'm not sure I want to be around once the federal mon the government stops printing money because I think we're going to be in a world of hurt then all of a sudden to pick up the tab on our own. Yeah. And then what would you label as some of your accomplishments or the body's accomplishments this year? This year, we, we finished up, and this goes to both sessions. Uh, the session prior to this, I got past House Bill 316 which was so it was John 316 because I was John carrying the bill <laughs> <laughs> and so but and that basically said that the people on the indigency fund and the cat fund which are people that end up with high medical bills they could no longer participate in that if they qualified for Medicaid and if they qualified for the insurance exchange now whether they bought into the insurance exchange was their own decision. And I said, look, it, I'm not gonna force you to buy your insurance, but I'm also not gonna have this taxpayer pick up your bill if you don't. And so this saved the states, uh, the cities and the counties a lot of money, especially the counties, because they had to pay the indigency fund and the state a fair amount of money. We basically ended those two programs. And so, I, and then this year we had to do a, a trailer bill on that one, which dealt with, um, people that come into the hospitals there was still going to be some some gap in there and so we did a trailer bill that picked up that for the hospitals so that nobody gets hurt by it but it's it's just a and it was something that I wanted five six years ago when Otter was governor I tried to get it then and I couldn't so sometimes it takes a while to get what you're looking for and so I think for for me I never you know I'm a little bit different than a lot of legislators I may work on something and then when it's done, I'm done. And I, f I forget about what, what bill I carried or which bills I introduced and I just move on to, to the next project or the next issue that, that's around. And so uh, I just, uh, yeah, I don't carry a lot. I sign on to bills that are needed. You know, we did a hospital assessment bill to help pay for Medicaid. I carried that one, you know, to help uh, the state on the cost of, of, of Medicaid and the hospitals didn't like it, but they agreed to it, and so, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, you said uh, when we were talking about how you got, when you got into this, that you kind of were like, I don't know how they let me here, but you know, you did say that you served on several boards, you know, the health and welfare, um, a school board, uh, you know, those kinds of things, and then you're also a farmer and a business owner. So you have experience uh, that, do you think those things, you know, education, health and welfare, agriculture business, are those the things that drive your policy making or your policy decisions? Most of my faith is what drives my decisions. That's, that's the filter I look everything through. But having served on school board, I've served on dairy boards and stuff like that, I know that you have to work with people who disagree with you. I mean, I've, I've had some serious uh, issues when I was on school board. We worked through it, but you, you, so in legislature, you have that same process. Not everybody's going to agree with you on everything, you know, and so you, you have to learn to, to listen to people who disagree with you and, and work with people who might disagree with you because maybe on the next issue they might agree with you. And so that, you know, served on the board and running, and I was chair of uh, s several of them, um, during that time, you know how to conduct a meeting and you know how to listen and you know how and you know that not everything turns out the way you wanted it to. And, you know, going into this race, through the recent redistricting process, you're now lumped in with another incumbent. Yep. Which is probably not fun. What nope. were your immediate thoughts when you saw that? I was really frustrated with the redistricting because the map prior to the last map, they, the district below me had no incumbents and the district above me had no incumbents and yet I'm stuck with, with four incumbents in one district. And you think, why would you do that? Matter of fact, I had suggested that they could easy drop the two uh, mile, square miles where I'm in, in this area and drop it into CUNA. So I lost most of my base and the person I'm running against, uh, Representative Furch, it's mostly his district that I'm running in. But 10 years ago, that was part of my district. So I lost Southwest Boise when they redistrict 10 years ago, and now they gave it back to me, and now I lost all of CUNA. 
And so, and it's always hard to run against an incumbent. They may have a voting record, but they aren't necessarily, you know, you don't differ that much with them. And, and my opponent has, has gone somewhat negative, and I, some people had suggested that I do that, and I said I won't. I, I'm running on my record, look at how I vote, look at what I've done, and I'll, I'll run on that. If, if that isn't good enough, then I can't help it. And, you know, with that constituency changing, is, you know, how do you feel, do you feel like you still apply to their needs, like that you still fit the needs of your constituency and that you understand them? I know that you said it just flip-flopped a little bit. Yeah. Um, but do you think you're ready and prepared for help, you know, serving your constituency and knowing their needs and wants in the legislature? This is a really strange district. And I don't think there's a uniform need in the district because a third of it is CUNA and CUNA School District. Another third of it is Meridian and Meridian School District. And the other third is Boise and Boise School District. So I have three school districts and three cities that I'm dealing with. Well, if I get over to the far end of my district, their big issue is McGurdio Park. They want to make sure that preserves, and I'll fight with them on that one because that's what it was sold as, and that should stay. But the people that over here and the CUNA part, the, the, that issue doesn't doesn't come to their forefront at all. And so, it's to me, it's really hard to find a consistent message that fits the whole district. And so, as I, you know, if I serve this district, it'll be interesting uh, working through that process. I think I can do the, the basic overall issues that the state requires or that the state is looking at. Property taxes everywhere, you know, especially here in Ada County, and, and, and budget. And, and, and I think as you look at you know, how much we depend on the federal government and stuff like that, and infrastructure are issues that fit probably everybody in the district. But individual issues from each section of the district, I, I'm not sure how that's going to work. You know, I, I can't be on both sides of the issue. It's just not, doesn't work. And so I, I may agree with some of them on sometimes and disagree with them on others. And how do you intend to, you know, reach out to this new constituency and hear their needs? I've, you know, I've been walking the district. I've, I've we, we, I handed out, I think, 300 uh, yesterday with my daughter and then, 200 uh, the day before that I just going on doors and and dropping lit and talking to people if they're out there and stuff like that and so it's just yeah I, I'm always willing to listen I always find and, and this is the bad part I thought two years ago during COVID is you couldn't knock on doors you couldn't talk I I love knocking on doors and talking to people I find a lot of interesting people and, and just talking to them rather than but you know and then that that's what I guess I'll plan on doing again. So. And then, you know, what do you think sets you apart from the other candidates in this race? I think I can get things done. Uh, I work with uh, a lot of the different people in the house. I've been there long enough. I've got a reputation of getting things done. Uh, the, the representative I'm running against pretty much votes no on just about everything. <laughs> and and so you know I, I I look for an answer rather than than just no. There's some things I I, I would almost feel like to vote no, but it's it, you can't, you know, because you got to fund the government, yeah, and the government has to function. I'm just trying to make sure it functions properly, and with the uh, with the minimum uh, uh, effect on on the people. I I've, I've always felt like even like schools, I would rather that the state doesn't set policy on schools. That we just send a lump sum to the school, it's so much per kid, that's it. Or the money follows the child even. And that's it. And youth side, because I think what CUNA needs in their school is totally different than what downtown Boise needs or what Burley needs or what, you know, any of the other, you know, Parma needs or whatever. So every school, I find that some, we so often set up programs for education. Well, we, we got this uh, innovative program and there's so much money in it. So the school develops the program because there's money, not because that was the program that the school wanted. And so I, I would much rather just say, hey, because every school district is different 
and I can't, you can't set policy statewide for what the needs are. I mean, if you've got a, a school district that has a lot of low income, they may need a whole different ball game than if you have one that's an eagle. You know, it's, it's a different group of people that are going there and, and using the schools, and so they're all different, and, and the schools need to serve whatever their community is. That's that idea of local control. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, then, the, you know, then the, we had it at a forum that we had when we sought that out. Then they wanted to, then the, uh, the chamber wanted to know if, well, if I was okay with local option tax. Because that's local control, right? I said, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there's a limit of local control. But I really think the education part, we, we set programs that this one size fits all and it doesn't work. It, it's, not, it's not effective. And I, I want better results out of education than what we're getting. We, we spent a lot of money into the, the reading program, and it hasn't moved the needle. Well, why? Well, what's, you know, what's going on? We did the health care thing this year, and we had some people come to us, well, this is going to cost us money because the other money you gave us for health care, we're actually using somewhere else. And so, well, yeah, but this was supposed to be for health care, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Is there anything else that I didn't ask you about that you want to make sure the voters know about, you know, you and your policy? I think we're at a crossroads now as far as a state and as far as a country in our freedoms. When the government can tell you your business isn't essential, can shut you down, when the media can turn around and cut you off and say you're not allowed to be on Twitter or you're not allowed to be on Facebook or shut you down. And, you know, the federal government has now got a, a misinformation board. And I think, where are we going with this? And I think our freedoms as for saying what we think or, or stuff like that gets labeled incorrectly and the government able to shut down all businesses except for which ones they decided were essential is a real critical crossroads that I hope we never get into again and I hope we can back back away from that we did some legislation I think to protect that but I think our our freedoms are at a crossroad from from where I think we should be